I am there all standing. They are going to take me out, hang me pretty soon. In the meantime, I say my say and write in these pages the other times and places. After my sentence, I came to spend the rest of my natural life in the prison of San Quentin. I proved incorrigible. An incorrigible, terrible human being, at least such is the connotation of incorrigible in prison psychology. I became an incorrigible because I abhorred waste motion. The prison, like all prisons, was a scandal, and an affront of waste motion put me in the jute mill. Criminality of wastefulness irritated me. Why should it not? Elimination of waste motion was my specialty. Before the invention of steam or steam-driven looms 3,000 years before, I had rotted in prison in old Babylon. Trust me, I speak the truth when I say that in that ancient day we prisoners moved more efficiently on hand looms than did the prisoners in the steam-powered loom the rooms of St. Quentin. The crime of waste was abhorrent. I rebelled. I tried to show the guards score or so of more efficient waste. I was reported. I was given the dungeon and the starvation of light and food. It emerged and tried to work in the chaos of inefficiency of the loom rooms. I rebelled. I was given the dungeon plus the straitjacket. I was spread eagled and thumbed up and previously beaten by stupid guards whose totality of intelligence was only just sufficient to show them that I was different from them and not so stupid. Two years of this witless persecution I endured. It's terrible for a man to be tied down and gnawed by rats. Stupid brutes of guards were rats. They ignored the intelligence of me, gnawed all the fine nerve to the quick of me and of the consciousness of me. And I, who in my past have been a most valiant fighter, in this present life was no fighter at all. I was a farmer, agriculturist, desk type professor, laboratory slave, interested only in the soil and the increase of the productiveness of the soil. I fought in the Philippines because it was tradition of the standings to fight. I had no aptitude for fighting. It was also ridiculous the introduction of disruptive foreign substances into the bodies of little black men folk. It was laughable to behold science prostituting all the might of its achievement and the veto of its inventors to the violent introducing of foreign substances into the bodies of black folk. As I say, in obedience to the tradition of the standings, I went to war and found that I had no aptitude for war. So did my officers find me out because they made me a quartermaster's clerk, and as a clerk at the desk I fought through the Spanish-American War. So it wasn't because I was a fighter, but because I was a thinker that I was enraged by the motion wastage of the loom rooms and was persecuted by the guards into becoming an incorrigible. One's brain worked and I was punished for its working. As I told Warden Atherton, when my incorrigibility had become so notorious that he had me in on the carpet in his private office to plead with me, as I told him then, it is so absurd, my dear warden, to think that your rat throat was so guards can shake out my brain the things that are clear and definite in my brain. The whole organization of this prison is stupid. You are a politician, you can weave the political pool of San Francisco saloon men and ward healers into a position of graft such as this one you occupy, but you can't weave Jude. Your loom rooms are fifty years behind the times. But why continue the tirade for the tirade it was? I showed him what a fool he was and as a result he decided that I was hopeless incorrigible. Give a dog a bad name, you know the saw very well. Warden Atherton gave the final function to the badness of my name. I was fair game. More than one convict's dereliction was shunted off of me, and was paid for by me in the dungeon on bread and water, or in being triced up by the thumbs and my tiptoes for long hours, each hour of which was longer than any life I have ever lived. Intelligent men are cruel, stupid men are monstrously cruel, Guards and the men over me from the warden down were stupid monsters. Listen, and you shall learn what they did to me. There was a poet in the prison, a convict, weak chin, broad brow, degenerate poet. He was a forger. He was a coward. He was a snitcher. He was a stool. Strange words for a professor of agronomics to use in writing, but the professor of agronomics may well learn strange words when pent in prison for a term of his natural life. This poet forger's name was Cecil Winwood. He had prior convictions, and yet... Because he was a sniveling cur of a yellow dog, his last sentence had been only for seven years. Good credits would materially reduce his time. My time was life. Yet this miserable degenerate, in order to gain several short years of liberty for himself, succeeded in adding a fair portion of eternity to my own lifetime term. I shall tell what happened the other way around, for it was only after a very period that I learned. This Cecil Winwood, in order to carry favor with the captain of the yard and thence the warden, prison directors, the board of pardons, and the governor of California framed up a prison break. Now note these three things. A. 
Cecil Greenwood was so detested by his fellow convicts that they would not have permitted him to bet an ounce of bull Durham on a bed bug race, and bed bug racing was a great sport with the convicts. B. I was the dog that had been given a bad name. C. For his frame up, Cecil Winwood needed the dogs with bad names, the lifetimers, desperate ones, the incorrigibles. But the lifers detested Cecil Winwood, and when he approached them with his plan of a wholesale prison break, they laughed at him and turned away with curses for the stool that he was. But he fooled them in the end, forty of the bitterest wise ones in the pen. He approached them again and again, he told of his power in the prison by virtue of his being trustee in the warden's office and because of the fact that he had the run of the dispensary. Show me, said Long Bill Hodge, mountaineer doing life for train robbery, and whose whole soul for years had been bent on escaping in order to kill a companion in robbery who had turned state's evidence on him. Cecil Winwood accepted the test. He claimed that he could dope the guard tonight of the break. Talk is cheap, said Long Bill Hodge. What we want is the goods. Dope one of the guards tonight. There's Barnum. He's no good. He beat up that crazy chink yesterday in Buckhouse Alley, and he was of duty too. He's on the night watch. Dope him tonight and make him lose his job. Show me, I will talk business with you. All this Long Bill told me in the dungeons afterwards. Cecil Winwood demurred against the immediacy of the demonstration. He claimed that he must have time in which to steal the dope from the dispensary. They gave him the time, and a week later he announced that he was ready. Forty hard beaten lifers waited for the guard Barnum to go to sleep on his shift, and Barnum did. He was found asleep. He was discharged for sleeping on duty. Of course that convinced the lifers, but there was a captain of the yard to convince. To him, daily Cecil Winwood was reporting the progress of the break, all fancied and fabricated in his own imagination. The captain of the yard demanded to be shown. Winwood showed him, and the full details of the showing I didn't learn until a year afterwards so slowly do the secrets of prison intrigue leak out. Winwood said that the forty men in the break in whose confidence he was had already such power in the prison that they were about to begin smuggling in automatic pistols by means of the guards they had bought up. Show me, the captain of the yard must have demanded. And the forge report showed him. In the bakery night work was regular thin. One of the convicts baker was on the first night shift. He was a stool of the captain of the yard, and Winwood knew it. Tonight, he told the captain, Summerface will bring in a dozen of forty-four automatics. On his next time off, he'll bring in the ammunition, but tonight he'll turn the automatics over to me in the bakery. You've got a good stool there. He'll make you his report tomorrow. Now, Summerface was a strapping figure of a bucolic guard who hailed from Humboldt County. He was a simple-minded, good-natured dog, not above earning an honest dollar by smuggling in tobacco for the convicts. On that night, returning from the trip to San Francisco, he brought in with him 15 pounds of prime cigarette tobacco. He had done this before and delivered the stuff to Cecil Winwood. So, on that particular night, he, all unbeaten, turned the stuff over to Winwood in the bakery. It was a big, solid paper-wrapped bundle of innocent tobacco. Stool baker, from concealment, saw the package delivered to Winwood and so reported to the captain of the yard next morning. But in the meantime, the poet forges too lively imagination ran away with him. He was guilty of a sleep that gave me five years of solitary confinement and that placed me in this condemned cell in which I now write. And all the time I knew nothing about it. I didn't even know of the break he had inveigled the forty lifers into planning. I knew nothing, absolutely nothing. Brest knew little. The lifers didn't know he was giving them the cross. The captain of the yard didn't know that the cross was being worked on him. Summerface was the most innocent of all. At the worst, his conscience could have accused him only of smuggling in some harmless tobacco. And now to the stupid, silly, melodramatic sleep of Cecil Winwood. Next morning, when he encountered the captain of the yard, he was triumphant. His imagination took the beat in its teeth. Well, the stuff came in all right, as you said, the captain of the yard remarked. And enough of it to blow half the prison sky high, Winwood corroborated. Enough of what? the captain demanded. Dynamite, detonators, the fool rattled on. Thirty-five pounds of it. Your stool saw summer face pass it over to me. And right there, the captain of the yard must have nearly died. I can actually sympathize with him. Thirty-five pounds of dynamite losing the prison. They say that Captain Jamie, that was his nickname, sat down and held his head in his hand. Where is it now? He cried. I want it. Take me to it at once. And right there, Cecil Winwood saw his mistake. I wanted it, he lied. 
for he was compelled to lie, because being merely tobacco and small packages, it was long since distributed among the convicts along the customary channels. Very well, said Captain Jamie, getting himself in hand. Lead me to it at once. But there was no plant of high explosives to lead him to. The thing didn't exist, had never existed save in the imagination of the wretched windward. In a large prison like San Quentin there are always hiding places for things, and if Cecil Winwood led Captain Jamie he must have done some rapid thinking. As Captain Jamie testified before the board of directors and as Winwood also so testified, on the way to the hiding place Winwood said that he and I had planted the powder together. And I just released from five years in the dungeons and eighty hours in the jacket, I whom even the stupid guards could see was too weak to work in the loom room, I who had been given the day off to recuperate from too terrible punishment. I was named as the one who had helped hide the non-existent 35 pounds of high explosive. Wynne would let Captain Jamie to the alleged hiding place. Of course they found no dynamite in it. My God, Wynne would lie. Standing has given me the cross. He lifted the plant and stole it somewhere else. Captain of the yard said more emphatic things than my God. Also, on the spur of the moment, but cold-bloodedly, he took Winwood into his own private office, looked the doors, and beat him up frightfully, all of which came out before the board of directors. But that was afterward. In the meantime, even while he took his beating, Winwood saw by the truth of what he had told. What was Captain Jamie to do? He was convinced that 35 pounds of dynamite were loose in the prison, that 40 desperate lifers were ready for a break. Oh, he had summer face in on the carpet and... Although Summerface insisted the package contained tobacco, Winwood swore it was dynamite and was believed. At this stage I enter, or rather I depart. They took me away out of the sunshine and the light of day to the dungeons, and in the dungeons and in the soldier cells out of the sunshine and the light of day I rotted for five years. I was puzzled. I had only just been released from the dungeons and was lying pain racked in my customary cell when they took me back to the dungeon. Now, said Winwood to Captain Jamie, Though we don't know where it is, the dynamite is safe. Standing is the only man who does know. He can't pass the word out from the dungeon. Men are ready to make the break. We can catch them red-handed. It's up to me to set the time. Tell them two o'clock tonight. Tell them that with the guards doped, I'll unlock their cells and give them their automatic. If at two o'clock tonight you don't catch the forty, I shall name with their clothes on and wide awake then, Captain. You can give me soldier for the rest of my sentence. And with standing in the forty tight in the dungeons, We'll have all the time in the world to locate the dynamite. If we have to tear the prison down stone by stone, Captain Jamie added valiantly. That was six years ago. In all the intervening time, they have never found the non-existent explosive. They have turned the prison upside down a thousand times in searching for it. Nevertheless, to his last day in office, Warden Atherton believed in the existence of the dynamite. Captain Jamie, who is still captain of the yard, believes to this day that the dynamite is somewhere in the prison. Only yesterday he came all the way up from San Quentin to Folsom to make one more effort to get me to reveal the hiding place. I know he'll never breathe easy until they swing me off.